As promised in Chapter 6, Chapter 7 is dedicated exclusively to membrane structure and function. So you may want to look back at Chapter 6 and even bits of Chapter 5 for a richer understanding of this chapter. Here are our objectives 1 through 6 and 7 through 13. This chapter is all about membrane structure and function. Membranes act as boundaries between cells and within cells. Every cell has a plasma membrane that is considered the line between inside and outside the cell. The plasma membrane, like all membranes in the cell, is selectively permeable. Some things can cross the barrier easily, some with the input of energy and others not at all. Back in chapter 5, I spoke of lipids in general and phospholipids more specifically. Recall that phospholipids are amphipathic molecules with both hydrophilic and hydrophobic moieties. The phosphate group attached to glycerol is the water-loving part, and the fatty acid tails are water-fearing. Because the cytosol is an aqueous solution and the surrounding environment is watery, the phospholipids orient themselves into a bilayer spontaneously. Biochemical analysis of the membranes revealed that they were mostly composed of phospholipids and also proteins. It wasn't known how these components were assembled, so some educated guesses were made. Our current view of how membranes are structured is called the fluid mosaic model. In this slide, you can see two models for explaining the biochemical data of membrane structure. The Daniele Davson model was also called the sandwich model. They predicted that the phospholipid bilayer was sandwiched between solid layers of protein on either side. This idea persisted until better instrumentation in the form of electron microscopy made visible the structure of the membrane. The Singer-Nicholson model is also called the fluid mosaic model. The phospholipids are able to flow freely like waves on a tiny ocean. That's the fluid part. The proteins float in the phospholipid ocean, anchored by the placement of hydrophilic and hydrophobic amino acids on the surfaces. They're able to move around the ocean like boats, not stuck in place like islands. The proteins are the mosaic. Singer and Nicholson were able to shear the membrane of a cell using a technique called freeze fracture. Then they visualized the parts of the membrane using scanning electron microscopy. The result? They could see where the proteins were floating in the phospholipids rather than sandwiching the bilayer. Just as a reminder, in this chapter we're going to see a lot of diagrams like this. Phospholipid bilayers presented as these gray and yellow shapes, which are cartoons representing the space filling model over here on the right. Two fatty acids, ester linked to glycerol, with a third ester linkage to the phosphate group. The proteins that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer are anchored in place because of the chemistry of the R groups in the amino acids. Nonpolar amino acids are found on the surface of the protein where it interacts with the fatty acids, and polar and charged amino acids, which are hydrophilic, extend into the cytoplasm and the extracellular region. The phospholipid bilayer has the mosaic of proteins that are anchored by R-group chemistry, but the membranes are also fluid, meaning they have flow. The phospholipids are able to flow laterally within a single face of the bilayer with relative ease, 10 million times per second. That's pretty free flow. Crossing from one face of the bilayer to the other, that is difficult. Not impossible, but comparatively speaking, very tough. So, how do we know any of this about the membrane? One classic experiment was performed by Fry and Edidin and published in 1970. They took mouse and human cells and were able to label the surface proteins on them. The membranes of the cells were fused, and after a short period of time, the proteins were found to have migrated throughout the hybrid cell rather than staying within the donor hemispheres of the cell. Once again, looking back at Chapter 5, we saw steroids with their characteristic four-ring structure. Remember, cholesterol is just such a molecule. Cholesterol is a hydrophobic molecule, though the hydroxyl group is a tiny hydrophilic part. This allows cholesterol to fit right into bilayers, though the effect on membranes depends on temperature. 
at relatively warm temperatures, like human body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius, cholesterol dampens the flow of phospholipids. When temperatures drop, cholesterol's effect on fluidity changes, as it cannot be packed as tightly, thus it maintains flow. Why? Because the fluidity of membranes is very much temperature dependent, as we saw with different melting points of fats back in chapter 5. Think butter versus vegetable oil at room temperature. Butter is solid, vegetable oil is liquid. Why? Why don't all living things have the same fatty acids in their membranes? Temperature. Phospholipids have the very important function of forming membranes, but that part of that function is maintaining fluidity. In these images, the bilayer with the unsaturated fatty acids are shown as being more fluid and the saturated fatty acids as being viscous. Well, that is true at a fixed temperature. Organisms that live at warmer temperature, either climatically or because of producing body heat, tend to have a higher proportion of saturated fatty acids. Organisms that live in colder climates, such as plants and cold water fishes, have more unsaturated fatty acids that can have fluidity at lower temperatures. Organisms that live in colder climates, such as plants and cold water fishes, have more unsaturated fatty acids that can retain their fluidity at lower temperatures. And down here, you can see how cholesterol in animal cells fits right into the membrane with that hydroxyl group just poking out with the hydrophilic parts. Different organisms have different membrane components, as we've seen. There is adaptive significance to the membrane composition. As we see that organisms that live under variable temperature conditions are able to change their membrane composition in response. The image on the right shows the typical phospholipids that we're used to seeing and some oddballs. Can you guess where these oddball phospholipids are found? So I've rearranged the image on the previous page a bit. On the left, the normal type of phospholipids with ester linkages and forming a bilayer. On the right, these are the phospholipids found in extreme thermophiles, or some of the hottest living things ever found. Archaea living at temperatures up to 125 degrees Celsius. Yes, that's hotter than boiling water. How? Because these microbes live at the bottom of the ocean, at the Galapagos Rift, so the water is under enormous pressure, 1,000 times atmospheric pressure. In order to survive and reproduce there, you can see that their phospholipids have three adaptations going on. One, they don't have ester linkages, but even stronger ether linkages. Two, these branches on the fatty acids allow them to form cyclopentane rings that cross-link the hydrocarbons together. And three, instead of forming a bilayer, they have a monolayer of lipids with phosphate groups at both ends. As sexy 1990s Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, and he wasn't just whistling Dixie, as the expression goes. Moving on to the proteins in membranes, we know that proteins are tremendously useful molecules. The functions of the phospholipids are really to act as a barrier to transit into and out of the cell, like a wall, but not a cell wall because that's a different thing. But cells need to interact with their environment and with each other, so the boundaries need to have something analogous to doors, windows, doorbells, mailboxes, and maybe a number on the outside so the pizza guy cell knows when they have the right address. All of those types of functions are affected by proteins. Membrane proteins can be bound only to the surface of the membrane, in which case we call them peripheral proteins, or they can span the bilayer, in which case we call them integrins or integral proteins. Integrins are anchored in place with bi amino acids with nonpolar R groups. Remember the R groups are featured prominently in the tertiary structure of proteins. Often, these integrins have channels made out of alpha helices. Remember that's part of the secondary structure of polypeptides. In this image, you can see a typical integrin protein with a C terminus whoop, down here and an N terminus up here. This polypeptide is folded up and extending completely through the phospholipid bilayer. 
For the rest of the chapter, remember that blue represents the extracellular face or the outside of the cell. And this color, liver, orange, whatever you want to call it, this color represents the cytoplasmic side of the cell. These alpha helices have hydrophobic amino acids facing the fatty acids and hydrophilic amino acids facing the lumen of the protein channel. Hopefully now you're beginning to see how the R groups of amino acids work. The blue bits here represent the hydrophilic amino acids and the red bits represent the hydrophobic amino acids. Now that we know a little bit about how they fit into the membrane, I'm going to tell you about the functions of membrane proteins. Here you can see a list of the six major functions of membrane proteins, and don't worry, I'm going to go through these one by one. Our first three functions are illustrated here. Transport proteins function like doors to the cell. They allow molecules into and out of the cell. Just like the doors on our homes, they can function either like permanently open entryways, or they can swing open and closed, or they can be locked until the proper key is found to open them. Enzymes, as we saw in chapter five, are cellular tools that can speed up chemical reactions. Much more on them in the next chapter. For now, I'll let you know that it makes sense to have enzymes that work together anchored near to each other in the membrane rather than floating around in the cytoplasm. Let's say the cell needs to convert this red triangle molecule into a green circle molecule, only it can't do it directly. It needs to convert red triangle into blue square first with one enzyme, and then a second enzyme that turns blue square into green circle. Let's say the red triangle is a gift, and the green circle is a wrapped gift. To wrap the gift, you need gift and paper, scissors and tape. If you have just one gift to wrap, having all of those things all over the house is not a big deal. But what if you worked at a toy store and it's the holiday season? Probably keeping the gift wrapped, taped, and scissors all stored in one drawer makes a lot of sense in terms of efficiency. So anchoring enzymes together in a membrane is kind of like having a drawer full of tools with similar functions. Signal transduction is like a doorbell. A molecule outside the cell may bind to a receptor protein, like this orange wedge up here. This wedge acts like a finger, which then causes something to change inside the cell. Like when the doorbell rings, the person ringing the bell isn't necessarily coming into your house. Maybe it's just the UPS driver letting you know that your package has arrived. But you, inside the house, or cell, receive the signal and act. That is signal transduction. Cell-to-cell -cell recognition is another function of membrane proteins. These proteins often have a bit of polysaccharide bound to them, as you can see here, and they are called glycoproteins. Our bodies are quite good at distinguishing our own cells from foreign contaminants, which may be lurking. How do the cells know who is good and who is bad? Glycoproteins, that's how. In our house analogy, these proteins act like the numbers outside that identify our homes. Proteins can function to join cells together. We saw this back at the end of chapter 6. Tight junctions and desmosomes serve to knit groups of cells together into tissues, so they can function together, and this intercellular joining is achieved by membrane-bound proteins. Hey, look, there are gap junctions again. What do they remind you of? Is it transport proteins? Because it is. They are made of transport proteins. Any whoozle, the last function of membrane-bound proteins is another familiar one from the end of chapter six, the anchorage points for the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. We saw a bigger view of this slide just a short time ago. Do you remember what those orange twisty deals are? and the purple stuff outside. They are actin filaments, fibronectin, collagen, and proteoglycans. So these integrins that we saw in chapter six are like the studs in the walls of our houses that we can anchor things to, like our giant TVs and basketball hoops. So that finishes our talk on the six functions of membrane proteins.